there's no such thing as writer's block. He said, what that is, is performance anxiety that you've imposed on yourself because your expectations are too high. And he's like, just lower your standards. Lower your standards until you get started. In terms of patterns, we were talking about some of the things I've spotted. Meditation or journaling are performed by close to 100% of the people that I interview. What can I learn from the people I hate the most? Now this does two things. It forces you to separate your morality from your, your search for effectiveness. Right? It also helps you to develop some degree of empathy. And uh, those two are very powerful. So what can I learn from the people I hate most? Uh, it is a very, very useful practice. So I'll journal on that very often. Are you being busy or are you being productive? What makes you angry was one of the key pieces of advice that I was given by a writer named Poe Robinson. When I asked him, what do you do when you have writer's block? He said, what makes you angry? Or just write that. Copyright your faults. And of course there are weaknesses you should address, but then there are flaws that can be converted into strengths. Uh, so I think that's, that's another way to catalyze creativity or just creating anything is to realize that some of your biggest flaws may in fact be assets. This is Derek's recommendation to his younger self and really to any 20 or 30 something, but it applies to everybody, which is in effect, you can do almost everything you want in life, but you can't do it at the same time. And if you can just dedicate yourself to one thing for even a year, and then the next thing for a year, you can do those 10 things. He said, when I start to get really stressed out, I just stop because I realize 95% is enough for getting almost all of the results that I want and making it sustainable. The impact that I want to have on the world right now would be creating a benevolent army of super learners who test the impossibles. Are you hunting antelope? or are you hunting field mice? And the story he would tell is that of a lion in the Serengeti. He's like, if you're always chasing field mice as a lion, you'll get a snack, you might even survive, but you might end up starving because you're getting these little Scooby snacks, that's not his words, mine, uh, that, that make you feel good and give you the illusion of accomplishing something real. Mm. And for me, that's translated into, are you being busy or are you being productive? Yes. So copyright your faults. This is from Dan Carlin. But copywriting your faults. Dan was a radio guy before he was a podcast guy. And he was constantly getting criticized because he would, he would, he would go into the red. He would, he would shout and he was really loud and he'd go up and he'd peek and drive all the audio people crazy. And then he'd get really low and whisper and they're just like, dude, come on, you're killing me here. Making my job really hard. And uh, his supervisor, supervisors at the time, they're like, look kid, I, what people want is this like deep, dignified baritone voice for the radio. I don't have a voice for radio, so I can't do it. Later on, he had such a distinctive voice that people started complimenting him. And he's like, okay. So now this, this so-called weakness that he was unable to fix, so he didn't fix it. Uh, not only that, but he, he avoided fixing it by having the intro guys, the guys would be, please welcome, or please enjoy, blah, 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 Dan Carlin. And he'd say, he shouts, he whispers, or something like that. He had the intro guy do a caveat so that he didn't have to change his personal style, which later then became this huge asset. And his term is copyright your fault. It's like, now if someone imitates me, he's like, that's my jam. He's like, that's my shtick. And so that could be a question you ask, right? How might some of my biggest weaknesses be strengths or assets? I think that's a very useful question to journal on, and which I, which I tend to do just about every morning is freehand journaling and what are called morning pages. But uh, which, okay, talking about creativity, morning pages we should talk about. Julia uh, Cameron describes them as spiritual windshield wipers. <laughs> and the way I would translate that is when you do morning pages and, and you might just be complaining, like your lesser self, your worst self coming out on pages, just bitching and moaning, is you get that out of your system for the day. So you don't have it ricocheting around your head like a straight bullet for the rest of your waking hours, interrupting everything else. You just trap it, you freeze it on paper. 
and that practice has been tremendously liberating. Not only from a, a well-being standpoint, but from just freeing up my CPU so that I can focus on things that are more important. Because if I have all that, like, God, that guy and the dad and the dad, like, I should have said, bah, like, all that bouncing around all day, it's like you have antivirus software just slowing down your whole <laughs> Why is it so slow? It's like, yeah, because you're thinking about these stupid grudges that you're holding against people for trivial bullshit. Like, who cares if the guy at Starbucks bought the last thing of cashews, you idiot? Like, <laughs> that Ferris. Is deeply troubled. Yeah, like, Ferris pulled together. So, if I get it on paper, though, I'm like, okay, I've, like, I've dealt with that. Now, in the book, you encourage people to bounce around. What's one thing that you hope nobody skips? So the book's broken into three sections. You have healthy, wealthy, and wise, which is a nod to Ben Franklin. I mean, they're all interdependent, right? Because they're, they're sort of the, the three legs of the stool, healthy, wealthy, and wise. So I, think, I do think you need all three. So Derek Sivers is this like, programmer monk, philosopher king startup entrepreneur who started CD Baby, which was the largest marketplace for independent musicians at the time. Sold it for, I think, $24 million. But he and Seth Godin, I think, are two examples of people who are very good at genuinely, in real life, following contrarian rules that work exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. uh, so Derek uh, has, has a couple of one-liners that I think are really fantastic. Um, <laughs> so I'll give you a few. One is, if more information were the answer, we'd all be billionaires with six-pack abs. <laughs> That's a good one, right? It, just, just, just absorbing, not even absorbing, just reading and watching and listening to more isn't enough. Like you have to apply it, you have to use incentives. You have to have rewards and punishments set for yourself so you actually get things done, timelines, etc. So that's, that's one. Another one is uh, don't be a donkey. And that, so he, he says that to himself all the time, like don't be a donkey, don't be a donkey. And the reason is there's a, I wanna say it might be a philosopher's paradox, but I don't think it is. I think it's just a parable about Buridan's ass. So uh, it's about a donkey who ha is thirsty and hungry, and there's water on one side, a few feet away, and hay on the other. And he can't decide whether to do the hay first, the hay first, or the water. The hay or the water, and he dies of thirst at the end of it. He couldn't do them sequentially. So this is, this is Derek's recommendation to his younger self, and really to any 20 or 30 something, but it applies to everybody, which is, in effect, you can do almost everything you want in life, but you can't do it at the same time. And if you can just dedicate yourself to one thing for even a year, and then the next thing for a year, you can do those 10 things. But if you try to do all 10 at once, you're gonna be burdened's ass. Should I do this, should I do this, or should I focus on this, or should I focus on this? So, don't be a donkey.